uh, uh, the world and uh, diverse research backgrounds. And uh, also they uh, um, have very, very interesting research projects. Um, they will be in a dialogue with uh, diverse um, um, international scholars already established in these two disciplines. We have uh, quite an impressive program and we also have a very international audience as I see also for this session, uh, both on our Zoom screens as well as on um, the YouTube channel where we directly translate our event right now. So thank you all for joining us and First and foremost, I would like to mention that uh, Professor Andrei Portnov has united the expertise both of uh, his chair Entangled History of Ukraine at the European University of Viedrina uh, in Frankfurt Oda with the support of the DAAD as well as um, in strong collaboration with Prism Arena Research Network Eastern Europe uh, established at the Forum Transregional Studies and led by him. And he has assembled our organizational colloquium team. Uh, its other members include uh, Victoria Savchenko, Bujena Kozakevich, Lukas Jura, and me. Um, my name is Elena Budinova. I work for Prisma Ukraina. And uh, I'm very eager to open our today's session. It will be focused on um, perhaps the most popular dynamically developing and even more so hotly discussed reform process in Ukraine after the Euromaidan revolution, namely the decentralization process. Um, first, we will briefly look into perhaps some post-Soviet inconclusive attempts for reform by afterwards zooming into um, the complex uh, decentralization process uh, uh, after the Euromaidan revolution, including its main achievements, some um, problem areas, um, its impact on the regional development of Ukraine. Um, however, this all in light of the still ongoing conflict, um, war in Eastern Ukraine, as well as the annexation of Crimea. For this very ambitious purpose, we have invited uh, two scholars to elaborate more on these issues and shed some light on these uh, dynamic developments, namely Dr. Sophie Lambrogini, as well as uh, Simon Mushik. Um, how does the shift of power and duties affect local governance and um, administration in the newly amalgamated territorial communities? This is not only our research question just for today, but uh, it also shapes the content as well as the title of the bachelor thesis of Simon. Um, Simon Mushik, our main uh, speaker for today, has freshly started his master's at the International War Studies. This is a joint program between um, the University College of Dublin as well as University Potsdam. Um, Congratulations on this new start. Um, he, uh, in addition to this, he has, uh, he's also a student assistant for the professorship of uh, culture and literature of Central and Eastern Europe in, uh, at the University of Potsdam. And um, um, most currently, he, he was also an intern at the Center for Eastern European and uh, International Studies, SOIS, in Berlin. From there, in, uh, in his team, he has researched not only the decentralization process in Ukraine, but also um, the situation of Belarus security services. Uh, he also co-conducted uh, an interesting study on attitudes among the Russian youth. Um, apart from his academic work, uh, Simon has embarked on series of field trips as well as volunteer activities in the post-Soviet space, mainly in Ukraine. And on the other side of our virtual discussion table, um, just imagine it, uh, sits uh, Dr. Uh, Zofia Lambrogini. Uh, she's a passionate social historical researcher uh, with a 
quite an impressive explorative experience, both on the history of the Cold War with regards to the role of Soviet bankers, uh, as well as on the post-Soviet transition process uh, with regards to economic actors in Ukraine and Russia. Uh, she's uh, very, very interested in the complex um, conflict landscape in eastern Ukraine and its transformation under the influence of uh, systematic entanglements, but also um, trans frontline economic networks, infrastructural ties and collaboration prospects with civil society actors. Um, Currently, she's working for uh, a project at the Center for Advanced Studies in the Social Sciences based in Paris. Uh, and she conducts research on the post-Soviet economic history of uh, the Azov seaports, Taganrog, it's in the Russia's Rostov region and Mariupol, the so-called gateways to the Donbass. Um, she holds a PhD in Slavic studies from the University Paris in Nanterre. And um, whereas as a consultant for international development organizations or as a, a correspondent for Radio Free Europe, for example, or as a research associate at the Center Mark Block in Berlin, she has published just dozens of uh, papers, research articles and reports some of her most authentic and uh, impressive uh, research uh, insights on the Ukrainian society in the course of uh, more than 10 years stay in Kiev have been fused in quite an interesting book called The Ukrainians. I think this is the proper English translation, um, which I strongly recommend reading. Um, one final remark before I open the floor with regards to our discussion flow. Um, the first part of our talk will be shaped by an insightful presentation of Zimo's project. Uh, it will last about 30, 35 minutes. Then uh, Dr. Zafil Ambrogini will comment on it, give her constructive feedback. And afterwards, uh, our discussion will be dedicated to uh, opening the floor for contributions made by all of you, my dear external participants. So be brave. If you have a question or a comment or a remark, just click on the chat icon. It should be located at the bottom of your Zoom screen and uh, type your question or comment there. Um, as we have some concise um, Zoom time limits, I would like to warmly ask you to post only precise questions, thematic centered remarks, so that we can integrate them as much as possible in our overall discussion. Um, so without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Simon for his uh, very interesting presentation. Simon? Are you prepared? <laughs> I am. Um, yeah. Hello. The floor is yours. Um, yeah. Are you hearing me? Yeah, I think so. You should. Um, so let me start my presentation. What is it there? Right. Is it visible? Right. Yeah. 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 Great. So. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues and friends. Uh, so today I'd like to present on the de decentralization reform in Ukraine. How does the sh uh, how does the shift of power and duties actually affect local government in the newly formed amalgamated territorial communities? So this title, as Ellen already um, said, served as my recently submitted bachelor's thesis on which I did research during the last months, among others, at the, uh, as an intern at the Center for Eastern European and International Studies in Berlin. So uh, first of all, to attract your attention for the seemingly not really catchy topic, I want you to show Ukraine's map um, that, we got, uh, that we got used to see with its 24 oblasts. And it was often used to show and map the country's economic might in the southeastern, uh, southeastern regions, for example, which is maybe not as strong as it maybe has been, uh, had been, or it served to illustrate the political affiliation 
to pro-Ukrainian or Russian-attached Soviet nostalgic moods by Oblast, culminating in the well-known images of presidential elections of 2004 and 10, um, depicting Ukraine as an east-west divided country. But I want to propose uh, you to have a look at the following map, and it's Ukraine's new administrative ter territorial division of amalgamated communities and what looks like an endlessly crushed body of an unitary uh, indivisible state should matter for mapping Ukraine's economic, social and possibly political index of the future. So the division into oblasts, of course, will stay in place. But I want to show that uh, the decentralization reform underlines and supports a regionally differentiated approach. And for not stopping my talk at this point, I will elaborate on why and how this reform happened and continues to happen. Uh, to give you an overview, my presentation is meant to touch the following points. I will quickly say some words about the methodology of um, my research and then show the theoretical framework. And to get a better understanding of the current processes, we'll uh, take a look on history of Ukrainian decentralization attempts. Uh, and um, after this, we will um, yeah, have a more specific, uh, like, um, precise look on how the Ukrainian decentralization reform actually happened and happens. And um, yeah, elaborate uh, the changes on the ground. And finally, I will try to draw conclusions and uh, show you my source, my sources in the list of references. Um, right, so um, the methodology, how to study uh, Ukrainian decentralization. Um, my conducted research is based on three theories on legal and administrative legacies, the idea of democrat uh, democratization through decentralization and a decentralization typology to categorize different types of power redistribution. And um, on the sources, I of course mainly used, um, oh no, that's not, oh, no. Uh, of course I used mainly secondary sources like journal articles, monographs or assessment reports of national and international experts working for think tanks or assistance programs on the ground. As primary sources, I uh, examined laws, governmental orders and uh, budgets um, of uh, communities, amalgamated communities. And finally, I used socio sociology, uh, sociological data to assess the extent and character of change on the ground. So initially it actually was planned to conduct own comprehensive service in different this year, but due to known reasons, um, this could not be done and did not happen. But nevertheless, I had the opportunity to conduct a visit to Ukraine this summer. So I used the chance at least to uh, conduct uh, two interviews and some conversations uh, in the Chernivtsi region, which I will also um, yeah, president, uh, present then in the um, section about the decentralization reform on the ground. And yeah, um, luckily I could ass uh, assess, of course, I mean, I know everybody could, that, uh, could do that. Uh, so there are nationwide surveys and other sociological data um, on, yeah, on the topic. So people were asked, um, asked about the decentralization reforms reform in recent years. Um, so to start with the theoretical framework, um, I would like to start with um, the legal and administrative legacy. So there's, um, of course, administrative systems worldwide were established and shaped under the lasting influence of political, cultural and economic and of course, to different extent, religious circumstances over time. And the bureaucratic administration structures in modern nation state um, mainly appeared since the start of, or like since mid uh, 19th century in the Western world. Um, but these structures, of course, grounded on particular prior traditions. 
uh, in a diffusion process, similarities of local contexts, uh, context, political legacy and the church's role and other institutions group certain ideal types that describe countries uh, administrative systems. So I took a, um, a uh, selection that was made by Painter and Peters in their, uh, yeah, in their um, volume, Tradition and Public Administration. So they defined nine families of administrative uh, traditions, the Anglo-American, Napoleonic, Germanic, Scandinavian, Latin American, post-colonial, uh, South Asian and African, uh, East, East Asian, Soviet, which is uh, important for our today's topic and Islamic one. Um, so the legacy of Soviet traditions, um, tradition applies to, of course, the former USSR countries and other socialist um, ruled Central and Eastern, Southeastern European countries. And it was mainly shaped by the all pervading one party ruling. Um, so each national uh, communist party through its centrally organized subdivisions performed total control over the, all branches of the state. Um, there was the doctrine of democratic centralism that was carried out by directly elected Soviets or councils um, whose composition was strictly predetermined um, by the party. Um, so there was actually no explicit distinction between the party and the state, um, implying the absence of division between politics and administration. Um, also, we had a, a nomenclatura system in place um, that was like that based on the principle of personal organization, implying um, patron client relations. So the selected persons got positions on the basis of political and ideological um, reliability to the party, and therefore the leadership choose and approve the appointment of, uh, of officials to the state administration. So in many cases, personal relations, namely clientelism, survived the change of regime. Um, so even when uh, the institutions were changed, uh, people stayed in place and many of these um, yeah, former personal um, related um, related uh, patron client relations as well. Um, so the legacy does indeed matter for administrative reforms in these countries and the formal change of institutions proved to happen much easier than altering the practice of personal policy, particularly the politicization of the senior civil service staff, which was persistent in the following years. Um, yeah. Um, my next theory will, yeah, concerns the uh, decentralization typology. So while analyzing the character of decentralization change, um, the different, um, yeah, extent, of course, uh, can be, uh, can be observed. And yeah, of course, these uh, differences have uh, also some um, varying character and um, one approach to categorize the different forms of organizational and administra administrative redistribution is the tripartite model by Zamina Kuhlmann, which was applied in her studies of decentralization reforms uh, of France, uh, Germany and Great Britain. Um, so they are three types of um, decentralization. So the first type that she described is the administrative deconcentration. And uh, this means the transfer of or delegation of former centrally nationally concentrated functions to subnational administration branches, but they still belong to the national central state administration vertical or subordinate to it. So the national sub authorities or state owned agencies represent the central government acting on site, for example, I have this um, 
prosecutor's office uh, in Ukraine. I'm, but I guess in, in many other countries, it's as well that you have the central institutions and then the branches uh, going down. Um, yeah. And then there is administrative um, decentralization. Uh, and this describes the transfer of previously centrally administrated executive tasks and functions to a local self-government body. But unlike political uh, decentralization that will be shown in one moment, um, decision-making further continues to be centrally located. So autonomous decisions may merely concern the organization of the delegated functions and tasks on the ground. Um, but the local self-government administration is perceived and acts actually as an agent on behalf of the state. Um, yeah, one, one example that, I, uh, that came to my mind is, for example, paying the teacher's salary. So, yeah, the schools are, of course, perceived as, uh, as an issue of the central uh, government, but uh, so uh, local self-government uh, institutions uh, have to have to pay the salaries uh, and by that of course they act as an as an agent of on behalf of the state and then we have the third form which is political decentralization and um, this describes the most far-reaching change of affairs um, so this type of decentralization involves transferring functions and tasks from the uh, like to the territorial self-government unit with the right and legitimacy of an elected local representation body to decide on their execution and financing autonomously. So in this case, um, local self-government really can decide on uh, a lot of um, yeah, delegated and, and transferred uh, things. So no, uh, the last is, is on their side only uh, legal supervision and control may be carried out um, by central authorities um, or its local and regional representatives. For example, there is this uh, Institute of Prefects in France. So we have like the central uh, delegated prefects um, that, that uh, control or like um, maintain supervision over local self-government uh, bodies. Um, I think I have to hurry up a bit. So there's also a, um, a theory of democratization through decentralization. And this mainly um, concerns the, uh, that the dis uh, decentralization of power and uh, duties um, may lead to a higher accountability of civil servants for uh, local concerns and needs, uh, may also um, cause less corruption through uh, higher transparency and immediateness on the ground. And it is also, or it could also promote citizen engagement uh, through enlarged uh, control and participation poss uh, possibilities. Um, right. So now we'll start with our prehistory. Um, local government and decentralization in Ukraine until uh, 2014. So the reform of decentralization started after the Maidan revolution, um, but it didn't come out of the blue as the need uh, to reform the heavily centralized, uh, centralized administrative territorial system was present in the political debates ever since Ukraine's independence in 1991. So Ukraine's Soviet inherited administrative, administrative territorial structure of government um, consists of uh, four um, levels of four tired hierarchy, which I guess all of you know, um, that is the central government in Kiev, the 24 regions, oblasts, uh, including the autonomous uh, Republic of Crimea, and on the uh, third level, there is um, the sub-regional level, the rayon level, uh, which uh, had uh, 490 rayons uh, before decentralization. And we have the village or town communities, the romadas, um, there. So 
um, actually after independence. Um, the first years after independence demonstrated an ongoing struggle between the parliament and the president whose competences regarding regional and local government thwarted each other. So um, first the president imposed control over uh, local authorities um, by, uh, by uh, imposing his representatives to the uh, rayon and, and oblast administrations. But later the parliament uh, returned these rights and powers to, um, to the local councils um, to, yeah, to their right to form uh, executive organs um, uh, on their own. So then we had a constitutional amendment in 95 that granted the president actually like returned the right that once was taken away again by the parliament to appoint the oblast and rayons heads of administration. And we had the 96 uh, new constitution, the continuity of the Soviet uh, set system, but also with contradictions in sections uh, regarding local self-government when um, it was not clearly defined what actually a body of administr administrative territorial unit is so um, of course it was uh, said that this is the basic uh, unit of, of um, political uh, political uh, self-government in ukraine but for example kiev and sevastopol sevastopol um, still uh, had their special status which was not really clear because um, the uh, head of administration should be appointed there by the president, but at the same time, local self-government should have been carried out in this in this place as well. So, yeah, and in uh, 97, Ukraine joined the Council of Europe and ratified the European Charter of Local Self-Government. So formally adopted it, but actually, um, yeah, no, no, um, sophisticated uh, local self-governments was granted uh, to the um, communities. So we had uh, in 2005, after the Orange Revolution, a concept of administrative um, territorial reform that was broadly discussed, but stayed unrealized. We had the uh, 2010 presidency, uh, presidency of Viktor Yanukovych, uh, who strengthened and and um, yeah again was not a not a supporter of of uh, local self government, um, but he strengthened the power power vertical um, largely um, with his uh, party of the regions. And but then after two thousand and fourteen, after the revolution of dignity or the Maidan revolution. Um, as it is mainly called in the West, uh, the revitalization uh, of previous reform attempts um, was done. So we had already this uh, concept of uh, of decentralization uh, from the orange uh, after the orange revolution, and this was now um, yeah taken again. So it was quite fast that the new government already in April uh, 2014 um, introduced a, a concept and um, uh, laws um, pathing the way for, for voluntary self uh, uh, amalgamation of um, communities were already uh, passed in, in early 2015. So actually we can say yeah, so the discourse, also it's in the discourse uh, since the Maidan revolution, but uh, legally it started um, by 2015. So we have the Ukrainian decentralization reform, uh, reform and there's a nice, um, yeah, there's a nice image, which a diagram that was actually produced by the government informa uh, information portal, decentralization.gov.ua. So, I mean, of course, they tried to 
uh, depict it as, I mean, like in their way, uh, naming it chaos and, and uh, order. But um, yeah, you, you can see um, uh, that there, even though maybe you may not uh, read Ukrainian, that we had this, um, this uh, hierarchy here with this regional um, uh, level, sub-regional level, but then um, apart from the rayons, you had also the cities of oblast significance and um, they had their own councils. And here you had uh, different types of, of community councils uh, with uh, different um, legal status. So yeah, in the end, it was a, it was a, quite a hotspot of different um, legal entities which all um, yeah, were quite um, difficult to govern and to reform uh, even more. So there was this um, easy, like this yeah, smart decision uh, as, as expert was, would quote it, to just put it to this um, uh, threefold um, uh, hierarchy. So having, so this is all about um, local self-government yeah so of course we have the national level above but this is actually meant to be uh determined by uh, yeah by direct elections so you have the community level which uh so cities villages uh, and also towns may now um form communities then the number of uh, rayons uh, should decrease or is decreased now to uh, 134 actually, and um, so it yeah should replace the system. And how this happened, I will explain in a second. So we had the harsh economic crisis and separat uh, separatism demands plus a foreign military aggressions, uh, demand for fast and wide ranging reforms. Um, after the Maidan revolution, but also there was this window of opportunity, one could say that there was political will to conduct this yeah, really wide ranging change and brought international support. And also decentralization was seen as an answer to um, yeah, mainly Russian voiced federalization demands. So there was uh, this, uh, there were these demands in 2014 that um, maybe Ukraine should uh, federalize and give its oblast uh, special statuses. But actually, uh, this decentralization reform also was meant to uh, tackle this, these demands by, um, yeah, by conducting a, um, a redistribution of power, but in a different way, which I'll, uh, I will come to that, uh, to that later on. So we had the voluntary amalgamation of territorial communities and um, this yeah this law was passed in February February 2015 and it paved the way for autonomous merging negotiations to create this amalgamated uh, territorial communities so literally every uh, village council um, or town council or even cities council um, could um, could yeah could um, initiate a merging of of um, of uh, several communities and by doing that um, it was uh, it was um, how to how to frame it it was meant to to create this um, self-sufficient ATCs. So there was uh, there were methods um, passed by the by the uh, by the central government or criteria to form how to sort form these uh, ATCs. So there was um, taken into account the number of inhabitants, the number of school children, uh, the distance of the localities to the administrative center, the territory and the share of own tax revenues in the budget, and they all were given um, certain certain um, numbers uh, that, in the end, were counted. And then yeah, the 
these um, the results should uh, fit to a, into a certain certain uh, range, and then this amalgamation was considered to be um, self-sufficient. So that was actually the only rule. So uh, it was uh, really up to the communities with whom they want to to merge. Um, but this uh, also changed later on. So um, the main, yeah, the, like the carrot for these um, for these uh, uh, initiatives was uh, that these new um, communities should have the possibilities of direct uh, budget allocations from the center, uh, because uh, prior uh, previously they were only given or it was redistributed from the center to oblast and to the rayon level, and then only to the communities, um, which in the end for uh, many communities meant that uh, they, yeah, they haven't been any um, investments into local infrastructure for years. So that was um, creating the possibility of, of getting this direct budget allocations and also the access, uh, access to um, special funds. And in the end it was uh, meant for the ATCs to overtake the rayons tasks and functions. Um, yeah. So we uh, saw the um, completion of uh, the first stage of the of the reform uh, when actually we see how the number the number of ATCs um, increased over time until uh, until uh, last year so 2019 and then this year so this number is already actually quite fresh so um, only after the 25th of October um, to, uh, 2020 we have now the number of 1469 uh, communities but these are not all uh, voluntary merged. So you have this number of, um, of 900 voluntary merged um, ATCs and these are now uh, mandatory uh, merged, um, but I will also come to, the, come to that a bit later. So in this first phase, uh, we saw no constitutional amendments. So there was actually a try, of course, also to amend the constitution to entrench these changes um, into yeah, this important uh, document. But um, in August 2015, there was actually the, uh, the try to, to vote this, but there were, uh, was massive uh, discussion because um, also many uh, people, uh, or activists, they, they uh, feared that this will somehow Paved the way into to, to some uh, autonomy for um, the Donbas region. That um, yeah, this this time was uh, much more contested, and so this was postpone, uh, postponed. And also, we saw the completing of the um, of the first phase with some minority issues in Zakarpattia and Odessa Oblast, when actually. Uh, Hungary and Bulgaria, um, they initiated uh, some protests and also um, they also uh, threatened Ukraine with uh, with uh, stopping their way to European integration or NATO if they won't um, if they won't give uh, the Bulgarian and Hungarian minorities a proper um, yeah construct uh, or like a unit to to uh, be um, unified in so actually with Bulgaria uh, this was uh, settled by uh, yeah, explaining that actually in this Odessa and this region of Odessa Oblast there are um, a lot of villages of like different nationalities so actually it was of course not meant to somehow um, yeah deprive them of their cultural rights uh, so this is mainly uh, merely institutional setup, and uh, with Hungary, in the end, um, yeah, Ukraine authorities said that they actually like didn't um, approved 
the Hungarian uh, wishes, but in the end, we see now to have uh, that, uh, yeah, we have a rayon uh, where actually all like main Hungarian, uh, Hungarian communities of Zakarpatia are, um, are included in. So yeah, this uh, was by some experts seen as, as a, well, capitulation to, to the Hungarian demands, but on the other side, um, yeah, it also doesn't mean so much because uh, as, as said already, um, this uh, decentralization reform or even these new communities, of course, they have uh, much more power on deciding um, local issues, but of course it doesn't uh, grant them any possibility to um, to announce some uh, further autonomy or even uh, separation. So yeah, we'll come to phase uh, to the second stage, which um, which started after the last year's uh, wide ranging changes of uh, first the president and then also the the uh, Verkhovna Rada elections. Um, yeah, they, they changed a lot by uh, bringing in the uh, Sluha Naroda movement, Sluha Narodu, uh, which ga uh, managed to gain the absolute majority in seats. But um, actually the team of, of yeah, Volodymyr Zelensky didn't really um, cared about this decentralization reform. So there was a certain time of, uh, of yeah, uncertainty when it was not clear how to, how to um, continue this reform. But in the end, it was the, yeah, it was the decision to, of course, continue it um, also with, with many um, experts or, for example, the minister, I guess, for, um, in charge for that stayed um, at least for some months. And then we also saw a second failed attempt of changing the constitution. Um, so in late um, 2019, uh, Zelensky uh, submitted a, a draft law to the Rada, um, mainly with, this, with the same, with the same um, with the same proposals as uh, already in the previous version uh, that was submitted by Poroshenko. But um, there was also not voted yet because there was literally no discussion with, uh, with experts on that. And uh, so, yeah, even his, his uh, fraction, his uh, deputies uh, of Sluha Naroda um, said that uh, we won't vote for that. So the committee, uh, the committee, was um, was uh, urging to have further um, to have further uh, discussion on that. But then, yeah, other things happened, and this this um, these amendments are not on the uh, are not on the table anymore. So. Um, yeah, actually, then it was also a change of um, voluntary amalgamation to mandatory amalgamation. amalgamation. So we see a, yeah, a return of central power in this process when um, when the, actually the cabinet of ministers decided to uh, approve their own perspective plans. Actually, before that, uh, the oblasts were uh, the oblasts state administrations were asked to submit such plans, but um, then the government uh, decided on how these plans should look like. And with these plans, um, it was also um, it was also the de decision which un uh, merged communities uh, to include to other communities. But for example, there was also the highly criticized decision to liquidate 120 um, ATCs that were actually um, functioning, but uh, the government perceived, or like they said, that they, they don't uh, meet the, the um, self-sufficient criteria. So they're also by these plans, uh, they were meant to, to be liquidated. 
Mm. Yeah, and we had uh, we have well, we see the liquidation of Rayon State Administration and also actually the Oblast State Administration, um, which is a quite um, yeah difficult process after this first uh, voluntary amalgamation of of, um, of uh, communities. Um, yeah, so I will come to um, yeah say some say some words or um, to show you my my findings on the reform on the ground. So we have a survey. So I mean for uh, today's presentation, I chose only one survey. Actually, there are more of them. Uh, so this survey or this row of survey by the Kiev International Institute of, of Sociology uh, was conducted. Uh, four of them. Mm, the fifth should maybe be ready now, but it's, it isn't published yet. Um, so um, I only have the, the results for uh, this uh, published in 2019 um, survey. And um, this survey is quite comprehensive. So it um, included uh, around uh, 2000 uh, respondents from uh, more than 100 settlements in uh, of different sizes uh, yeah in all accessible um, accessible regions of ukraine so we see for example on the question uh whether people know about uh, the uh, developments uh, we see a quite um yeah quite uh quite um, stable um, knowledge. So uh, about 70% of the population uh, knows about this uh, decentralization reform. And actually uh, also broad, broad uh, majority um, thinks that this is necessary. Um, yeah, we see some change maybe here, but uh, mainly I would say that uh, the support or the the opinion that this um, is necessary prevails. Um, we also see uh, support for the amalgamation of, of communities because this may some somehow differ when when it comes to not only like decentralization uh, decentralizing power, but also on uh, whether like on whether the community a person lives in will. Yeah, maybe transformed. So we see um, among the residents of towns um, broad support of that, but actually for for um, cities or also bigger towns that also wouldn't wouldn't change much. Uh, wouldn't change much. Uh, of course, it's much more about the villages, and um, there we see, for example, um, the support, like quite broad support of, of uh, people um, that uh, support the amalgamation of the communities if their locality of, or their settlement will become the center. But we see, um, yeah, not a very big support of, of uh, people uh, when their village wouldn't become the center or if their uh, settlement. But we see, for example, in uh, 2018, that the larger number would approve that, uh, and this maybe uh, tells something about that uh, people already um, adapted or or they got information um, that of course it's um, unlikely that every village or that every village can be a center of, of such a new community. So yeah, but then we also see that um, people are quite um, that they are quite skeptical on how freely this um, yeah, local self-government actually should uh, decide and rule. So there uh, is, a, is a majority of more than 80% that thinks that uh, there should be state supervision over these um, local self-government bodies. And most people think that the prosecutor's office should um, should be this um, yeah this body or maybe some 
um, special body and um, yeah, the local administration or prefect, um, so the rayon administration or the, the transformed rayon administration is not really seen as a favorable um, as a favorable supervision body for that. Um, yeah, I will skip that. So yeah, I want to draw also some um, so I'd like to give some insights um, from these interviews about the reform on the ground. So um, there was uh, the Mamaifzi um, amalgamated community and it actually was merged in 2017. And by the words of the uh, mayor, Natalia Katruk, um, it was mainly to escape the financial dependence from the Marion State Administration. So actually, this um, this community was a front runner uh, in the Chernivtsi region, um, and actually, it was um, in a quite good position because they have high revenues for, uh, due to a geographic location on a national, uh, like on a road of uh, national significance, and since the tax code of Ukraine was changed um, so that actually um, the communities may, uh, I guess it's 5% of the of the um, exceeds uh, of the uh, gas stations will, will stay in the communities. And this Mamaevci uh, community has uh, 18 of that. So you can imagine that, of course, they have um, quite good financial uh, status. But also there were international assistance programs um, that supported the establishment of new structures and institutions uh, in this community by, for example, um, uh, equipping a uh, center for uh, um, delivering um, services to, to people um, doing uh, like obtaining new passports or registration acts so like yeah really bringing or like making um the uh, communication of, of uh, ordinary citizens easier with the state uh institutions carried out by a local self-government body and then yeah due to the perspective plan uh nine more villages will be added and actually also 10,000 uh, inhabitants. So that somehow shows that, um, yeah, this perspective plans that were um, that were approved actually in June this year really, um, yeah, bring some some uh, change to, to the already working um, communities. So, um, yeah, but there is no way or no possibility on um, on blocking that, so the mayor said, "Okay, we have we are enough self-sufficient, also in financial terms. So we also uh, will manage to to um, yeah, to add these nine villages and actually double the number of inhabitants of our community." And I also was in the Herza um, community, which actually borders with Romania. So its inhabitants its inhabitants are to a large extent of uh, Romanian ethnicity. But unlike Hungarian or Bulgarian uh, inhabited districts, separatism and uh, demands of special minority rights is not really a, not really an issue there. So there's this small town of um, of two thousand inhabitants. So it uh, it uh, amalgamated with uh, three other community uh, with two other communities. So there are about six thousand inhabitants then. Mm. Yeah, they had actually some problems with the Rayon State Administration, which is actually or which was uh, located in this town. So you have this. Um, so in the in the prior case in Mamaevci, you have this um, community which wants to escape escape uh, literally from from the Rayon Administration, but here it's uh, the Rayon Administration. Um, yeah, right next like next door to to the new. Um, Communities administration and um, many, yeah, also civil service uh, servants were reluctant of, um, yeah, giving uh, up some power and and functions and tasks to the new community. Um, so the mayor Vasil uh, Skripkaro he said, nevertheless they um, 
they uh, achieved some success, for example, by repairing roads, um, uh, buying a new ambulance car, or, uh, or uh, turning on uh, lights in the villages, actually, which uh, didn't happen for, for the last um, 10 or like decades, maybe, or like at least two decades, I guess. Um, so they also felt a strong support by international assistance programs. But yeah, maybe one thing to add there, for example, also one problem in their case was um, that they have a lot of school children not living in their community, but going to schools in the Herzog community. So the Herzog community has four school, uh, five schools actually, uh, which is yeah, quite a lot but um, most of the school children come from other communities. So there's also this very, yeah, concrete question of how this will be uh, managed. So there's uh, the possibility, of course, of communities to, to uh, conclude some contracts with each other to, um, yeah, to decide on, the, on financing this. But um, yeah, in this case, I guess they also will find find some um, some decision, some uh, result for that. So yeah, coming to my, dis to my conclusions, I would like to um, summarize that, of course, Soviet legacy continued uh, to prevail and shaped actually the country's post-1991 um, development. Um, there was a persistent of established structures. Um, so, uh, but nevertheless, of course, it managed to adapt to changing realities, um, to yeah, different presidents and and um, and uh, situations. So, the decentralization reform, which is well, which is underway right now, actually. Aimed is aimed at strengthening and introducing, if you may call it like a more Scandinavian or Napoleonic, Napoleonic like French style administrative uh, tradition by introducing very strong um, self local self government uh, with a high autonomy. Autonomy, but as at least uh, seen in the last um, uh, draft by uh, of the constitution uh, amendment with uh, the institute of a prefect which should be um, appointed by the president or yeah I guess by the president um, so yeah there should they, like it's meant to be a combination of of these two traditions um, yeah actually I would say that the initial concept was uh, political decentralization Mm, but we see threats of recentralization, for example, by a partisan local self-government in the um, just uh, past local elections. Um, there was a new, new election uh, uh, code that was introducing the mandatory um, run by of of um, candidates in, in uh, communities with more than 10,000 voters on party lists, which wasn't in, in place before. So we actually, uh, so like uh, national parties, because of course it's, it's mainly um, national parties that have the resources and also the possibility, I don't know, to promote uh, candidates. They uh, got the, the chance to um, to actually, sorry. Mm -hmm. they got the chance to, to um, yeah, have now their their people in in a lot of uh, communities that would most likely would prefer not to to uh, have run from this party list. Um, so there's this, yeah, some some could say threat of uh, recentralization by introducing this partisan, um, where of course, uh, central party leaders have a big influence who to choose and maybe who to kick out of the party. And also there's the undefined role of the new rayons. 
So we have now um, less rayons, but there is the question what actually these rayons should, like what their role should be. Um, since there's still a lot of functions left um, and there's, yeah, some would say the threat that uh, new rayons uh, will not give this, uh, or like will not hand this um, functions and tasks to, to the uh, communities. And we don't uh, have any constitutional entrenchment of the legal changes. So until all these changes are not in the constitution, um, yeah, literally it can be changed by, by ordinary law. And um, democratization, yeah, I would say there's maybe a lack of, uh, there was also some experts claim that there's lack of communication. Uh, we saw unfortunately a low, quite low voter turnout in the recent uh, local elections, which was also, and I guess uh, to some extent caused by different, by different um, uh, circumstances. And we see that actually improvement of material conditions prevail over participation activities so far, but of course it's too early to draw there some final conclusions. Uh, so I guess in the long-term period, it would be interesting to see whether um, this decentralization reform really uh, yeah, could promote some democratization efforts in Ukraine. Thank you. Sorry for being a bit too long. So there are some references, which I think, yeah, there are quite a lot of them. But if you are interested in articles and sources about the Ukrainian decentralization reform, I may send it to you. Thank you, dear Simon. It was uh, like real pain to interrupt you because your presentation was really detailed and interesting. And I think like from my personal perspective, you're ready for a doctor title. Um, however, due to our time limits, we will quickly jump to the uh, constructive feedback of uh, Dr. Lamborghini. I'm sure she has some very important insights to add. Uh, one uh, just last remark, um, I'm still encouraging all of our external participants, if you have questions or comments, just uh, uh, type them in the, our chat. Safi, the floor is yours, all yours. Here. Okay, um, hello, you can hear me? You can all hear me? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you, Simon, uh, very much for, uh, for your presentation and, uh, um, and also your, your paper. So uh, my comments are more directly based on your, on the BA thesis that you sent me and uh, which uh, basically lays out in far more detail, uh, but follows the presentation that, um, uh, that you did just now. Um, uh, so the two uh, fit together fit together quite well. Um, maybe um, in in some parts I'll add some elements referring more specifically to your presentation. Um, so in your um, in your thesis in your article you offer a, a solid factual overview of Ukraine's decentralization reform as it stands today and referring to uh, the basic standard seminal uh, um, literature uh, um, on, uh, on many of these aspects and especially the contemporary aspects of decentralization since 2014. Um, you propose to analyze how the shift of power and duties uh, within the central regional and local territorial administration have affected the new nucleus of local self-administration. Uh, so the ATCs um, that represent the fusion of previously smaller village entities into larger ones in order to um, provide a, a better a better service uh, um, uh, to, um, uh, uh, to to citizens. Um, <clears throat> these ATCs are infused with more prerogatives, responsibilities, oversight, and financial resources. Um, then, uh, and then, uh, and are supposed to provide uh, this better public service than the centralized top-down system that you presented. 
Um, at the same time, you say that decentralization reform is incomplete because the constitutional amendments necessary for its integration into the state system have not as yet been adopted. Um, you provide historical and normative context, laying out the tradition of centralized administration and devolution limit to asymmetrical fiscal decentralization and some local capacity to address local demands of uh, uh, minority rights. Um, referring to literature in political science and public policy, you show that the dominant view is that ATCs are the linchpin of the decentralization reform and, and of uh, its meaning for demo democratization and modernization um, in this very uh, European uh, or Western, let's say, uh, discourse. Uh, you pose the question of how decentralization has affected in practice at the local level uh, the uh, ATC then whether the transformation has had a positive effect, uh, effect uh, in this uh, democratization. Um, um, so uh, your, your last chapter and mainly your, I think, very strong conclusion uh, actually lay the ground for providing the preliminary insight to ask the question that you uh, lay out in your title. Um, because uh, what you're proposing to do is to investigate the gap between uh, models of uh, governance, in this case decentralization, and their adaptation and how uh, they contribute to uh, uh, expressing, experiencing uh, regional differentiations on the ground. Um, so uh, in terms of um, uh, disciplinary um, uh, fields uh, and frameworks, um, what you've been trying to do makes me think of like policy transfer studies at the nexus between sociology and uh, public policy analysis. Um, uh, so uh, the thing is that uh, your paper, which I understand is a, is a, is a BA paper, um, and therefore, of course, uh, is, not a, is not a PhD. Uh, nevertheless, um, I would like to make some suggestions uh, that you can, that would bring you to um, to actually um, give you the tools to analyze and to discuss uh, the question that you ask uh, in your title. Um, uh, so the idea would be to give, to give comments that help you shape and sharpen your arguments and help you achieve uh, uh, your goal, which is uh, to appreciate how the reform has affected local governance structure and practice. Um, so first of all, I would suggest that you reverse in a way the way in which you think about your research question. Um, uh, you look at your title, well, governance, uh, if you look at any definition, uh, is uh, in its most simple way, it's the action of government, uh, of go governing. And the important word here is action. Uh, so uh, let, me, let me explain um, uh, that uh, I would suggest that um, uh, if you're going to continue this work, uh, in order to effectively answer your question, that you should um, focus on action, which means on actors, on agency, on practices, on strategies, uh, in order to see on the ground how uh, things are working. And actually, in your presentation, I think that one of the most valuable uh, inputs that you had and the most valuable sources was actually the way you described your interaction, your interviews uh, with uh, the... Um, uh, the authorities in uh, Herza and Mamaisi. Um, and uh, uh, not only were the, the, those three minutes that you laid out, uh, we, I think we, we got a lot of information in uh, what problems were actually were like on the ground and what the limitations were, what the com competition was on the ground. But also in the way you presented it, um, uh, one could actually see uh, 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 your, um, your better understanding of what this reform was all about. Um, uh, so the question is, so what type of data will help you understand governance in terms of action? Um, so as I, as I said earlier, uh, the framework could be uh, one of uh, uh, sociology and uh, public policy analysis, so at the brink of the uh, two. Um, uh, so, uh, of course, the sociological surveys um, uh, can help you with this, uh, but uh, again, the, the, the main information might come from um, primary or secondary sources, 
that reflect uh, um, experience, right, um, uh, action. So these could be the interviews and in the present day conditions, I understand that is very difficult, but perhaps um, uh, um, um, more exploration of local uh, media sources um, uh, uh, that perhaps reflect the problems that ATCs are confronting day to day to actually be able to, um, to implement uh, their, uh, their rights. Um, <clears throat> uh, so by mapping the, uh, the human and structural dynamics at play, um, uh, you can look at how the structures are in place, the old inherited uh, inst uh, institutions, for instance, interact uh, with the new institutions and the actors involved. Um, uh, in a way, creating a kind of um, discussion of the making of ATCs. Um, so these actors could, for instance, uh, include uh, based on, on the work you did, uh, based on, 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 your, on your paper, could include domestic actors such as policymakers, national and local economic actors, such as industry and landowners, educational authorities, ordinary citizens, of course, because they are voters, uh, as well as the and international donors and capacity builders that you mentioned. And so uh, I see a very rich of ground for qualitative sociological analysis that opens paths of inquiry about this reformed governments. Um, how do local actors behave now versus earlier? How do they obtain and negotiate the prerogatives that are theirs? How do they collect taxes, for instance? So what is the actual process from defining the tax base to technical collection? Um, lack of expertise has been uh, mentioned by many authors uh, that are in your bibliography. So how do new lo local officials learn? Um, what kind of pressures do they face, resist, or um, comply with um, coming from local oligarchies, power brokers? Um, and uh, so what are the strategies that they uh, adopt? Um, uh, so. Uh, also some other suggestions to, as I said, to kind of shape and sharpen um, uh, your paper and make it in a way more dynamic, right? That, you're, uh, that everything you write should be, uh, you know, kind of going towards answering your research question. Um, uh, so uh, uh, I have a few, you know, suggestions you could take uh, or leave some of them. Um, it's impossible to include all of them, of course, uh, in, one, in one paper. Uh, but first, uh, uh, keep in mind that you could challenge uh, the decentralization equals de democratization framework and model, right, uh, that is proposed by Europe, because this is um, a constructed narrative, actually, and not some kind of objective pr proof, uh, truth. Um, a, central, a centralized state uh, can be just as democratic. Um, and uh, uh, can also be in certain conditions, uh, a lever of modernization uh, and of security, for instance. Um, also, I refer you to your own bibliography that some of the authors have written about this. And I can also provide you with uh, more sources on that, referring uh, specifically to the Ukrainian example. Um, uh, uh, the uh, historical context, uh, speaking about the uh, um, uh, I'll take first the Soviet historical context, speaking again about governance and action. Um, uh, uh, I'll disagree with you, you know, on the point where you say that there was total control um, uh, on the Soviet system, uh, which is not quite true because already in 1969, there was a, a very, very good book that was published uh, by Jeffrey Hugh called The Soviet Prefects. Um, and that showed how in the Soviet Union, local party organs in, uh, actually had agency and autonomy in industrial decision making. So it shows to what extent there were spaces uh, very early on um, uh, uh, for this type of agency, even in the Soviet system. Uh, so of course, uh, this also existed in, in Ukraine and there was probably some kind of inherited um, um, uh, um, 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 legacy of this, perhaps. I mean, it is a question you could ask. Um, on the genealogy of the decentralization reform efforts, uh, again, I would tie it uh, um, more tightly with uh, the political dynamics. Um, uh, 
for example, when you mentioned that the post-2014 decentralization reform is developed on the backdrop of the Ukrainian crisis, um, the sections uh, in your paper kind of fit to convey the actual sense of urgency, the fear in Kiev of, uh, or throughout Ukraine of occupation and direction that pervaded the spring of 2014. Uh, so some key moments in this respect are, for example, uh, the conference of, uh, on regional autonomy that was uh, being held in, in Kharkiv uh, and that you know, was planning to actually attend on the day when he fled to Russia on February 22nd, 2014. Um, the fear also in that spring of separatist forces taking over in the south, uh, in Odessa, in Bessarabia, in Mykolaiv, um, uh, uh, through the anti-Maidans, right? Um, and later, of course, to become the Novo uh, uh, project. Um, and to show the urgency in finding and trying to find a solution, an incomplete and imperfect solution uh, that was taken out of the drawers of previous uh, reform efforts. Um, um, so, uh, 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 also, even if you go further a little, uh, a bit further, uh, this urgency uh, in thinking about um, uh, central periphery relations and local relations uh, was also uh, uh, was 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 uh, was critical in in, uh, in two thousand four in the Orange Revolution, which you did mention, but even in nineteen ninety five when uh, uh, the Autonomous Republic of Crimea actually. Uh, 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 declared uh, its independence uh, and then its secession in 1995, uh, which spurred reactions from the center. Uh, so brings me to my last point. Um, uh, the, uh, that uh, what I see again in this shaping and sharpening uh, is the very strong link between uh, decentralization, ATCs and the Ukrainian security context and the fear of, uh, um, relating to um, um, geopolitical security um, and sovereignty and uh, economic security. Um, and so uh, um, uh, I was wondering that perhaps this would be a path to, uh, to pursue. Um, uh, so by bringing out in your material how decentralization and the special status uh, for Donbass uh, are tied and scrambled in the political discussions uh, and made it impossible to pass these uh, constitutional amendments uh, in August 2015 and actually um, uh, provoking the first uh, uh, um, non-war-related non, uh, deaths uh, in, uh, um, in Ukraine uh, after, after Maidan. Um, um, uh, so uh, uh, the tensions that you mentioned that also um, uh, refer to security issues uh, in Zakarpatia, which uh, you mentioned as and, uh, and relevant, uh, but also in sanitary Okay, that um, it would be a good thing to introduce the COVID context into uh, into the discussion about ATCs because it it, it played a role right um, uh, in the spring when uh, Zelensky rolled out uh, his strategy and uh, uh, the whole um, hospital uh, reform that was in part integrated into the devolution of certain um, uh, health policies to local uh, authorities was actually put into question. And as for I know the, the but understood right, all these financial flows were completely filled. Uh, then uh, a last point is also the security and economic security, perhaps. Um, uh, uh, exposed uh, by the enclaves of captured resources, uh, whether they are land or coal, or amber in Western Ukraine, uh, and how these uh, kind of political criminal enclaves uh, um, threaten to compete with ATCs. Um, um, so, uh, so, so these are like my main suggestions. I have some more for you, but I see that the time is kind of. Uh, uh, running to a close, and uh, we actually have 10 minutes or so, or 15 minutes, I guess, for 
uh, discussion, but um, I'm happy to my comments and uh, with some bibliographical, bibliographical sorry, uh, references. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for uh, the additional insights you have given to Zimon's project, Zofi, and uh, uh, your comments were just most interesting, and I really think that uh, they will really help uh, Simon in the further development of his project. Right now, I see that we are quite out of our time limits for our open discussion. That's why I would like to suggest that we first focus on some questions by our audience. And afterwards, Simon can uh, wrap up the talk by answering them or you also. Uh, and uh, also give his uh, authentic impressions from your feedback or what would be useful for him. Um, however, first and foremost, uh, we have an interesting point shared by Victoria Sergienko from the uh, Historical Institute in Warsaw. Um, and she has a question, actually. I'm reading. The idea to create an institute of prefects uh, supported by President Poroshenko and then Zelensky caused a lot of controversy among experts. You've mentioned this aspect, but could you tell us more about the essence of this idea? And is it still on the table? Um, yeah, so first of all, thank you very much, Sophie, for your uh, comments. And I re really uh, take them into account and um, yeah, maybe uh, in the framework of an essay, I try to sharpen, of course, uh, the, the focus um, to bring it down to a very, yeah, concrete aspect. But um, answering to the question of Victoria, I would, um, yeah, I can answer that uh, this uh, Institute of Prefects, I mean, like, literally there, there will be and there has to be a, a institution that will somehow supervise um, also the legal um, implementation of, of a lot of um, yeah, everything literally also on the uh, so -called uh, local uh, self-government level but um, it was highly criticized for um, for being quite um, well, quite a strong a strong uh, instrument when the president can when uh, appoint this um, this person, which of, of course will also have some uh, like apparatus, and there was uh, the a proposal that uh, prefect can stop um, a local council's um, activity if he or she will uh, perceive a decision of a council as unconstitutional, which is of course important, uh, especially in, with regard to security issues. So, for example, if I don't know. A, um, community um, of um, national minority would uh, I don't know, take a decision to separate or to 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 uh, impose some um, rules that are contradicting the constitutions. Of course, there should be an instrument to stop that. But um, people uh, or like experts um, criticized this um, yeah, this uh, proposal for not being. Um, uh, yeah, focused in us. So there, by an ordinary law, the Verkhovna Rada could have uh, expanded this uh, rights of an perfect. And um, by doing this, um, people were just uh, thinking, okay, the president has a, like a direct button on uh, on his table by um, influencing so a local self-government uh, in in uh, literally every community in Ukraine, but. Yeah, so that was the discussion, but um, yeah, there will be some su supervision um, institute, I guess, but uh, I think with some, um, yeah, with some limited um, possibilities of, of, of interfering local self-government. So should I maybe also go to the next question or? Um. Yeah, it's focused on the uh, definition of Ukraine by some researchers as a neo-patrimonial state, for example, Halle, and uh, taking into account uh, such a system uh, in which formal institutions do not really play a significant role, uh, as the common states, what are uh, the outcomes uh, and the implications of this reform? 
Hmm. Yeah, I think there's a, that's a point that uh, is also quite important. And of course, we, uh, we see this, um, yeah, this um, kind of, of um, interaction, I guess, uh, or we saw this for, for quite a while in, uh, in Ukraine's east or not only there, but in towns, for example, we have, where you have some uh, companies that are the main taxpayers and the main uh, employer. So of course these companies have a, a lot of a um, lot of power also on uh, influencing law, like in many cases, uh, literally controlling um, uh, the local self uh, yeah, governance there, um, and of course with with uh, now changed economic um, uh, circumstances, of course also big uh, agricultural corporations um, do have this role. Um, and for them, it's maybe even easier to, to influence uh, or to yeah, carry out their control in the village than in a yeah, relatively like big city or in town. Um, so, of course, there's the idea that, um, that of course, all these, um, these uh, corporations should uh, pay taxes on the ground, which... Um, will encourage them somehow, of course, to, to do that because, I mean, like that or there's the idea that it will encourage them more to do that because these taxes um, to a larger extent will stay um, there. So um, yeah, by paying, paying taxes, it, they could really improve uh, the life of, of uh, citizens there in the, in the community. But at the same time, especially also with the right to uh, sell uh, land um, which was, I guess, in March, there was the decision. Um, it's still at the constitutional court, but um, there's this project yeah, to, to liberalize the, the land market in Ukraine. And of course, when you control a, a local council or you can influence it, and the local council now has, uh, yeah, is, the owner has the property of the, of the land, it may, um, yeah, be quite easy to to uh, to um, to to get the land uh, sold uh, to to these um, persons to local oligarchs. So um, yeah, of course, uh, there's also the, the the threat or the fear that local oligarchs or lo local oligarchy will be only strengthened by by this re uh, reform. But in the end, yeah, there's the big hope that uh, in the end it somehow could also contribute to, to some legalization of, of this uh, power or informal structures when, um, when actually, uh, yeah, the business can be legalized and, and taxes will stay in the, in the community and in the end will benefit um, yeah, the corporations themselves. Thank you for <clears throat> your uh, comprehensive uh, comment. And um, due to our constrained time limits, um, I would just like to give uh, some two or three minutes uh, for another uh, comment and a question by Ursula Wooley, uh, who is from the University College London, and she will be our next presenter next week, uh, exactly at your place uh, in our virtual discussion table. Um, and uh, she is asking that uh, whether if you continue uh, with the development of your research project, how do you imagine this new decentralized structure is most likely to become uh, to the point of breaking like weak points of it? And uh, in how far um, do you see it is vulnerable? Um, uh, to changing local, national and international politics? Or do you think it is robust? Um, so yeah, I guess some some weak points. I, I uh, hope I, I showed also in my quite short uh, conclusion in the end. So I guess the um, partisanship, of course, is a well, like is a problem um, that uh, national parties, of course, now have um, have a quite strong influence on structures that actually should serve. Um, the people on the ground, so um, by definition, self-government. 
is the right of, of people um, living in certain uh, on certain uh, territory to to rule out things um, as as they want and um, yeah by having this influence also of, of national party projects, um, which uh, especially in the recent uh, elections was quite quite um, uh, good illustrated by yeah, having candidates from, from these parties where um, yeah, you could only uh, yeah, think how, how these people could actually join this party, but um, obviously they did. Um, so that would be one weak point. And another could be, as, uh, as um, there's no constitutional amendment, um, the structures, of course, will prevail or they will continue, but uh, their financial resources, financial resources couldn't be, for example, cut by an ordinary law. So uh, even if there will be this uh, structure of, um, of uh, amalgamated community, of course, they have their own resources and especially when there's no um, state uh, land uh, given or like handed over to them, they have some really like their own resources. But uh, when yeah, the tax code will be will be changed and and uh, there will be much uh, less possibilities for them to to carry out their work. I guess it will be somehow end up in a, in a way that maybe will come close to this um, to this administrative uh, decentralization when you have of course um, new buildings, nice. Um, nice uh, service centers, for example, for, for citizens on the ground. Uh, but in the end, uh, the central government um, will, or, yeah, will still decide on, on most of the issues, even of those um, uh, that should be uh, decided on the ground by, um, yeah, somehow, uh, yeah. Giving the money only only for for some uh, reassurances um, of of conducting certain uh, projects. Mm, so yeah, this one question of the Chernobyl uh, uh, catastrophe uh, managed to the best of um, I think that this is uh, more or less a comment regarding uh, the, um, so to say, autonomy of local governments in the Soviet Union, which uh, actually shows other results at uh, the example of the explosion in the Chernobyl plant and how crisis management function uh, these years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, like maybe it may be not, of course, related directly to Chernobyl, but I mean, like one uh, interesting fact is also, uh, which is also uh, related to maybe the weakness of, of the central power, but how um, cities or communities, it was actually also mentioned in the interview I had with the, with the one mayor, uh, that um, they feel encouraged now somehow to decide on their own, uh, also when it comes to the current uh, COVID pandemic which is in some yeah in some cases I guess quite absurd when when there's some central order but then uh, in the towns in the cities they say no we don't we won't do that and we will um, say that uh, weekend will be working this as well um, uh, for not uh, yeah being or like having to close uh, shops and, and, and markets so yeah, I think there may be like some people may also feel an over encouragement and that which is even like uh, uh, exceeding their rights because I guess um, to, to tackle a pandemic, some central orders should still uh, be in place. But I guess that is mainly um, mainly problem of, of weak uh, central management in Ukraine now. But yeah, that somehow maybe shows how, how local um, uh, authorities, yeah, have their own thoughts of, of how to how to uh, rule out and how to uh, get along with the pandemic. Okay, um, 
I think that uh, we can end the discussion at this point, if you agree, uh, in the interest of uh, saving some time also for the evening. Um, and uh, thank you, thank you, thank you really um, for all of your contributions, especially those of our speakers today, uh, Dr. Zofia Lambrugini, as well as Simon Mushik. Um, the attention of our external participants, as well as uh, the whole fruitful discussion, um, including contributions made by them. Our weekly colloquium continues also next week, exactly at 6 p.m. Central European time. Um, and we will meet again here in the virtual Zoom hall. Um, this time we will focus on discursive political strategies during the Poroshenko presidency of the example of Poltava for reapproaching public local historical identity. And as I have already mentioned, our speaker for next time would be Ursula Huli, a doctoral researcher at the University College London with a quite um, wide based expertise uh, in the expertise in the exploration of instrumentalization of historical narratives, wartime securitization of memory, but also post Maidan public histo history. Uh, and politics related to it. Our commentator would be Volodymyr Koluk uh, from uh, the uh, National Acad Academy of Sciences in Ukraine. He's uh, really an expert in uh, ethnopolitics as well as media discourses, uh, historical narratives, language politics and attitudes in Ukraine and in the post-Soviet space. And uh, he is the head research fellow at the Institute of Politic and Ethnic Studies at uh, the National Academy mm -hmm. of Sciences. So we are really looking forward also to our next event and I hope to meet you all soon, again on the Zoom screen. Login details remain the same. Meanwhile, just stay safe and stay tuned for our next online talk.